Avengers Endgame is terrible. This appears to be an unpopular opinion for reasons which frankly do not elude me in the slightest, but nonetheless tempt me to walk into a lion enclosure wearing trousers made of steak. The path we're about to tread is a scary one, wrought with painful revelations regarding our culture's baffling indifference towards good storytelling. Positivity and optimism will be fleeting going forward. This isn't the fun boat, or the fun train, or the fun aeroplane. Am I being overly dramatic? Absolutely. Is talking about a dumb superhero movie in exhaustive detail a worthwhile use of mine or anybody's time? Probably not. But then again, shut up, let people hate things. I feel compelled to push back against the seemingly prevailing notion that Avengers Endgame is a good film, because frankly, I do not want Endgame to set a precedent for what films ought to be. It concerns me that a film with an utterly nonsensical plot, moron characters and horrendously broken world building is currently ranked higher on IMDb than Wally, -E, Django Unchained, Raiders, Aliens, The Father, Die Hard, Citizen Kane, and Unforgiven. <laughs> When I first watched Avengers Endgame, I thought it was alright. Being a somewhat fan of the MCU, I entered the theater excited and left with a smile on my face. Having experienced all the feelings I imagine the creators of this film wanted me to, put simply, I liked Endgame, but you know, with the benefit of hindsight, it's become clear to me that a lot of my positive feelings about this film were almost exclusively derived from the things it did which appealed to my monkey brain. The novelty of these characters interacting with one another, the jaw-dropping spectacle, the simple and unchallenging jokes. Avengers Endgame is an easy film to enjoy, but only if you don't think about it. Stories are not scenes in isolation. They are not just the payoffs or a string of cool moments completely divorced from one another. A story is a sequence of events. The sequence matters. How the events are connected matters. And it's here where Endgame completely falls apart. It's almost astounding how little sense this film makes. From the characters to the world building, I can't think of any single component of this film which is without flaw. This is the worst Avengers film. Yes, even worse than Age of Ultron, which I guess would make it about as bad as Zack Snyder's Justice League. Now I realize convincing some of you of this assertion is gonna be harder than selling fire insurance to a long-tailed carpet shark, but unlike my New Year's resolution to finally finish my goddamn novel, I'm entering into this endeavor with a lot of confidence. What I hope to illustrate today, dear viewer, is that Avengers Endgame is broken. But more importantly, that there is no reason it needed to be. I can sympathize with how challenging it must have been to create a film like Endgame. I don't doubt that everybody involved in its production worked very hard to make this film all it could be. However, much of what's wrong with Endgame comes down to the writing. The most fundamental component of any story, and one which isn't contingent on money or technical limitations. That's what's so frustrating about Endgame. It could have been great. Many of its components certainly are. The performances of the cast are excellent, the soundtrack is terrific, and at times, this film is a visual treat. But the screenplay is the story. And the quality of the writing in Avengers Endgame is, excuse my French, fucking abysmal. Before I get into explaining why, I'd like to take this opportunity to preemptively address some of the criticism I expect to be levied at this video. Be warned, the following few minutes will feature high levels of needlessly cruel snark. Wow, imagine seriously critiquing a stupid superhero movie. I'm glad you agree this movie is stupid. Seeing as we appear to have reached the same conclusion, I suppose there's no reason for you to continue watching this video, so do feel free to piss off. Aw, oh, come on! Yeah, the time travel mechanics in this movie are dumb, but they're clearly not an important part of the story. Well over a third of Endgame's runtime is devoted exclusively to time travel-related scenes, 
scenes, several lines of dialogue are dedicated to explaining how time travel works in the MCU, and the stakes of the story hinge on time travel. Might be that we're simply using different definitions of the word important, but in my defense I'm using the actual definition. Oh yeah, like you could do any better. You might be right about that, but my psychiatrist insists that I shouldn't be so hard on myself. To that end, I've elected to be harder on other people instead, you hypothetical lobotomized ceiling fan. I doubtless haven't accounted for every piece of criticism to be proffered in response to this analysis. And hey, if I get things wrong, feel free to point it out. But if there's one thing I may ask of you, it's that you simply allow me the chance to present my arguments without immediately writing them off as stupid or pointless because this is a comic book movie or because you personally enjoyed watching it. To further speak to this sentiment, you may have noticed that this here video is, uh, long. The first half of this critique is dedicated mainly to breaking down the plot, with the characters being the focus of the second half. I recognize that not everybody is going to be as enthusiastic as I am about dissecting the time travel mechanics of a superhero movie, so if you don't really care about a thorough breakdown of the plots, feel free to skip around to the sections which may be of more interest to you. I'd prefer that you watch the whole video, but hey, your computer or phone, your choice. To be clear, I'm not here to steal your feelings. If you like this movie, good for you. However, I'm also not in the habit of acting like a film with problems doesn't have any because of its genre. I've seen the best of what this genre has produced. Superhero movies are entirely capable of being great stories in their own right. Into the Spider-Verse and Civil War demonstrate as much. Avengers Endgame is a poorly written film, but it did not need to be. To understand exactly where and how this film goes wrong, we first need to take a step back and examine the circumstances of its creation, as well as its place within the MCU. Some are quick to label superhero films as completely devoid of merit. Given how many of them are crap, the prevalence of this viewpoint doesn't come as much of a surprise to me. That said, I think the Marvel Cinematic Universe is a nifty idea. The franchise's present status as a money-making juggernaut has obfuscated just how innovative and risky the MCU really was. It's the first of its kind, a film series which marries the strengths of long-form storytelling with the production values of blockbusters. The pioneer of the shared universe format, no other franchise has come close to dethroning it. But, if we're being honest with ourselves, the MCU hasn't exactly set the bar all that high. The neat aspects of the shared universe format of storytelling are patently obvious. A narrative told over dozens of films rather than two or three presents an unparalleled opportunity to take multiple characters on the types of lengthy journeys formerly found exclusively in serialized TV shows. Plus, seeing characters from different film franchises come together to fend off bad guys is just cool. But these these benefits are tethered to a significant trade-off. One, which the creators behind the MCU have neglected to account for most of the time. With each new installment in the MCU, the writers must account for more plot threads, more lore, and more characters. Because each new story brings with it implications which will invariably ripple across the series. What happens in one movie matters in another. For better or worse, it's a quintessential double-edged lightsaber. The shared universe format of storytelling relies on continuity, and the quality of the MCU's world building has been highly sporadic at the best of times. Phase 1 was probably the most coherent era of the MCU, likely because things were simpler back then. The writers didn't have to think about the mystical elements of Doctor Strange or the cosmic worlds of Guardians and Captain Marvel. The earlier films also didn't have to account for the presence of other heroes because the Avengers didn't exist yet. The challenges which come with constructing a coherent shared universe hadn't yet arisen. The longer the MCU went on, 
the more apparent it became that completely self-contained stories simply didn't make sense anymore. One was forced to ponder why Steve didn't show up in Iron Man 3, or Tony in The Winter Soldier. The broader world demanded acknowledgement, and that acknowledgement eventually came in Phase 3. The MCU got exciting during Phase 3. The potential of the shared universe format was beginning to be realized. The likes of Civil War and Homecoming leveraged the world in which they existed to enhance the drama and to propel their leading characters forward. Infinity War was, in many ways, the culmination of the efforts made to interweave these characters and their stories with one another. Much more ambitious in scope than Age of Ultron, Infinity War capitalized on the films which preceded it to tell a huge story about a cast of largely well-realized heroes clashing with a terrifying yet understandable villain. A villain whose means of affecting his will upon the universe was steadily introduced to us throughout the preceding decade. The MCU was probably in the best place it had ever been leading up to the release of Endgame. For all its issues, Infinity War laid down all the necessary groundwork for a stellar conclusion to the Infinity Saga. One which not only delivered on a grand spectacle, but also much needed resolution, and the full realization of the strengths of the shared universe format of storytelling. And, well... You blew it! You had it all and you blew it! Avengers Endgame tricked people into believing that it was the peak of this storytelling format, but in truth, it's a fucking waste of a movie. It squandered potent character drama, it discarded the logical consequences of Civil War and Infinity War, and it left the MCU in a very unsound place from a world-building perspective. How is that, you wonder? Well, I suppose I've kept you in subpar suspense for long enough. Let's begin. The statements, I'm going to write a time travel story, and I'm going to invade Russia during the winter have a lot in common. <laughs> It seems like such a foolproof idea at first, but before you can say sacre bleu, your story is in tatters and or your entire army freezes to death on the way back to Paris. Look, I get the appeal of time travel stories. I really do. There's something innately interesting about the idea of traveling backward or forward in time and using the knowledge you alone possess to become the most powerful agent in that world. However, and this is just a friendly piece of advice that you don't have to take, but I would highly encourage you to at least consider if you plan on writing a time travel story. For the love of all that's good, honest, and true in this world, please put some fucking thought into it. Or alternatively, don't even try, give up. Time travel tends to work well in stories when it's either a central element of the plot and the subject of thorough exploration, or if it simply enables the story to exist and then becomes a non-factor thereafter. Basically, it's an all-or-nothing paradigm. Explore it thoroughly, or get it out of the way as quickly as possible. But there is a third option, in much the same way that breaking your own leg with an elephant's rib is a viable alternative to either buying or renting a home. What is this third horrific way? To put it simply, the third and horrendously torturous way of telling a time travel story is to introduce it as a game-changing mechanic at the 11th hour to completely reverse, and thereby undermine, the consequences of prior story beats. Endgame is nothing if not fully committed to the third way. It's so committed to the third way that it cooks her breakfast every morning and massages her stupid feet. Before we can dive headfirst into analyzing Endgame's laughable time travel rules, I need to address the arthritic Galapagos tortoise in the room. I began working on this little project before Loki sprung forth into the world with the grace of an intoxicated Japanese spider crab, and I have elected to completely disregard everything that show has contributed to the MCU canon, because it has only made things worse. According to Loki, the sacred timeline is controlled by three robot space lizards, who themselves are controlled by Kang. There is no such thing as free will in the MCU. It was Kang all along. Everybody, whoever makes an incorrect choice, that being a choice Kang doesn't like, is melted by the Time Variant Authority. Whichever timeline the offending party came from is then promptly erased from existence. And by erased from existence, I mean sent to the end of time to be eaten by a purple cloud dragon called Riddle- I mean Sephiroth, I done Alioth. Oh jeez. Huh? Uh, sorry, C keep going. 
There is no multiverse, or at least there wasn't, until a version of Loki called Sylvie stabbed Kang in the gut. Up until that point in the MCU, there were only alternate timelines which exist briefly before being deleted. This universe is only one of an infinite number. Whoops. Apparently, new timelines are created by something called a Nexus event. They are not created when an individual travels back in time, nor are they created by the removal of an Infinity Stone from the past as the Ancient One claimed. The Infinity Stones create what you experience as the flow of time. Remove one of the stones, and that flow splits. Instead, they're created by variants whose existence makes no sense to me because why would anybody make any choice at any point in time which creates a new timeline? Why wouldn't that just be what happened the first time around? For whatever reason, the Avengers are not considered to be variants by the TVA because they were supposed to travel back in time to fuck with things. But 2012 Loki was a cosmic mistake, even though said cosmic mistake was created by the Avengers and and directly influence the actions of the Avengers in a way that Kang is clearly okay with, seeing as he never intervened during Endgame. I guess 2014, Thanos, Nebula, and Gamora are legitimate variants who were supposed to exist as well. Also, Infinity Stones can be removed from a timeline without consequence because the TVA has done so several times. They use them as paperweights. <laughs> Oh, by the way, don't tell me in response to my forthcoming criticisms that whatever timelines the Avengers went to were pruned. That's a nice way of saying that their inhabitants died horribly at the amorphous hands of a giant purple gas dragon. All that carnage is the fault of the Avengers for recklessly creating alternative branches. These are just a few of many reasons why I'm pruning Loki from this analysis. Regardless of the influence Loki demonstrates the TVA to have over time and space, the Avengers were completely unaware of their existence and thus unaware of their activities. They couldn't have possibly known that the TVA was cleaning up after them. As far as the Avengers were concerned, their plan was essentially airtight, which cannot be the case, no matter which story's time travel rules you accept as being canonical. However, the main reason why I'm not going to factor Loki into this analysis is because the show has established that free will did not exist in all the MCU films up until this point. That's just a terrible story decision, and one which I don't care to entertain, because if I did, all criticisms of any film in the MCU could be deflected with the response, well, Kang did it. Loki does not support any single time travel theory. None of what it introduces makes a lick of sense. The show only serves to hurt Endgame and the broader MCU. It's not going to factor into this critique at all, because if I had to account for everything Loki introduces, I'd have to preface every statement with, if things hadn't gone this way, the Avengers would have been melted by fascist space lizards. Wait, that's... Hold on. <clears throat> It's not going to factor into this critique at all, because if I had to account for everything Loki introduces, I'd be forced to preface every statement with, if things hadn't gone this way, the Avengers would have been sent to the end of time by Kang the Conqueror's space fascist lizard front organization to be consumed by a purple dragon cloud in order to preserve the sacred timeline from becoming a mess of branches which would inevitably go to war with one another and destroy the multiverse. So, swiftly moving along, the time travel mechanics in Avengers Endgame are completely and utterly broken. But to truly understand just how absurd the time travel scenes in this film are, we need to go back to basics. You can't expect to build a Dyson Sphere if you still find yourself stumped by the concept of doors. So, please take your seats, turn off your phone, shut the fuck up. Class is in session. I'm Professor Fringy, and this is Time Travel 101. Stories about time travel tend to feature one of three distinct rule sets. One, traveling back in time effectively creates an alternative reality which continues from that point. Changes made to the past cannot affect the time traveler because the future they came from no longer exists. Think Terminator. Two, a time traveler enters the past but remains tethered to the future, and any changes they make to the past affect them in real time. This is how Back to the Future operates. 
Three, a time traveler from the future cannot change the past because their interaction with the past already happened. Essentially, the time traveler was always present in the past. This is sometimes called temporal mutability. That was uh, a lot. Let's slow it down a bit to ensure that we're all on the same page. The alternative timeline mechanic is the most straightforward of the three. If traveling back in time creates an alternative reality, the future is no longer relevant to the story. That future has either been deleted or exists but is inaccessible. Time travel in these stories kicks off the plot and nothing more. Terminator and T2 function well as time travel stories for this very reason. The coexisting timelines mechanic is a little more complicated. In stories featuring this mode of time travel, the grandfather paradox becomes relevant. It's possible for a time traveler to delete themselves from existence. And from a storytelling perspective, paradoxes are basically plot holes. If you delete yourself from existence, you wouldn't have gone back in time to delete yourself from existence. So then you would have gone back in time, and then you wouldn't have and then you would've, and so on and so forth forever. Certain stories grant you the ability to infer what would happen in such cases. For instance, in Back to the Future, I think you could reasonably assume that had Marty failed to set the past straight, he would've been deleted from existence and the world would continue from that point as normal. Back to the Future is also advantaged by having all this occur before Marty was born, which grants the story a lot more wiggle room in which to operate. Looper is a much worse example of this coexistence timelines mechanic. In that film, it's shown that injuries sustained in the past are dealt to the future version of a character in real time. But that doesn't make sense. If your leg gets cut off, it wouldn't just poof out of existence. You'd grow old without that leg, which would completely change your future. What's important to understand about this mechanic is that there are no alternate realities. Everything takes place in one universe for better or worse, most of the bad time travel films adhere to this rule set. The temporal mutability time travel system is by far the most complicated one, and I personally find it can be quite difficult to grasp. Let me give you an example of how it works. Imagine Bob builds a time machine in 2021 and travels back to 1900. Chronologically, 1900 Bob existed before 2021 Bob used the time machine. Whatever Bob did in the past was already baked into the present in which Bob originally lived. In a certain sense, he hasn't traveled back in time because he already existed chronologically at that point in time. This basically means that all time has already happened, and so any time travel related conduct has already been accounted for within that universe. Again, somewhat complicated, but this is probably the most technically sound way of telling a time travel story. The problem posed by this system is that it's just plain difficult to write for. And there's something to be said about whether this system strips away some of the fun aspects of time travel as a concept. The alternative reality mechanic is the simplest from a narrative standpoint. And the back to the future mechanic is probably the most useful one for playing around with the past and the future in fun ways. But ultimately, it doesn't matter which system a writer chooses. What matters is choosing one rule set and sticking with it. The time travel mechanics in Avengers Endgame make about as much sense as the Schlieffen plan, primarily because this film cannot make up its mind on how time travel works in the MCU. So, we're gonna have to tackle this film's explanations in chronological order if we're gonna stand any chance of getting somewhere with this analysis. The first scene about time travel is kicked off by Ant-Man, who theorizes that time travel may be possible through the quantum realm. The reason why he believes this to be possible is because the five hours he spent trapped in the quantum realm amounted to five years on Earth. And how did Scott escape from the quantum realm? <laughs> well, you see, a rat just so happened to press a button on the machine sitting in his van and released him. This is what one might call an uh, astronomically unlikely coincidence. Why? Well, 
If Ant-Man hadn't entered the quantum realm just a few seconds before Thanos wiped out half the universe, and then been subsequently released five years later by a curious rat, the Avengers wouldn't have thought time travel to be feasible, they wouldn't have built a time machine, and the snap wouldn't have been undone. So, we're off to a fantastic fucking start. Shortly thereafter, Bruce provides us with our first explanation on how time travel works in the MCU. If you travel to the past, that past becomes your future and your former present becomes the past, which can't now be changed by your new future. You are a This sentence is absolute gibberish. It means nothing, it tells us nothing. It's pretty much just lampshading masquerading as an explanation. First, if you travel to the past, that past becomes your present not your future. You are now present in the past. This means one of two things. Either your conduct in the past may result in you being deleted from existence, which I don't think Bruce could reasonably rule out as a possibility, or it doesn't affect you, which means you've either traveled to or created an alternative timeline. Being the thick idiot he is, what Bruce fails to understand is that interacting with the past necessarily changes the past. This is inarguable. Let me give you an example of what I mean by this. Clint travels back in time, picks up a baseball glove off the ground, and returns to the present with the glove. What happens when a person from the past goes to pick up that baseball glove as they originally did? The only answer to this question is that they don't pick up the glove, which means the past has been changed. What this means to the person who traveled back in time depends on the rules at play. One possibility would be that by interacting with the past, they've deleted themselves from a existence. This would affirm the coexisting timeline's rule set. In other words, they never left their universe. The other possibility would be that they haven't traveled back in time, but rather they've traveled to or created an alternative timeline in which that glove no longer exists. No matter which rule set you think applies in Avengers Endgame, there are issues, and the film doesn't commit to either explanation. It pays lip service to the idea that it has rules which the world follows and a procedure which the characters are following while blatantly disregarding the very notion of cause and effect. When present Captain America fights past Captain America, what exactly happens after present Cap leaves 2012? The time he traveled to doesn't cease to exist. It keeps going. Do not tell me they create a self-contained bubble in time. We know this isn't true because we see several times during this film that time goes on even when the time traveler has left the past. If nothing has changed upon their returning to the future, there is only one explanation for what is happening in this film. The Avengers aren't traveling back in time. They're traveling to or creating alternate realities. And no level of charitability can conceal the problems this explanation presents. The film itself doesn't acknowledge that these are the rules it's playing by. There is a strong implication throughout the film that the Avengers aren't changing anything. But the changes they're making to at least one, but probably four alternate realities are very substantial. Removing Thanos and his entire army from 2014, for instance. Guardians doesn't happen in this reality, which probably means that Ronan won and blow up Xandar, so all that blood is on the hands of the Avengers. But in Loki, they said that- <laughs> It doesn't matter what Loki established regarding the TVA or Kang because the Avengers didn't know that the TVA or Kang exist. They would still be morally culpable for the consequences their actions may have brought about. Frankly, I don't think Marvel's plans with Loki were even considered when they were making Endgame, given how much of this film directly contradicts Loki. In other words, fuck Loki. We're not talking about Loki. Here's a question I'd like answered. Is it even possible for the Avengers Avengers to return to the exact same past timelines they initially visited? If going back in time the first time created an alternative timeline, why would going back in time again send you to that timeline rather than create another new timeline? Oh, fucking hell, say time ten times. If that's how time travel works in the MCU, the Avengers completely screwed over the other realities they took the stones from. Again, even if we discount the explanation provided by Loki, that the 
people in these timelines died horribly at the hands of the purple fart cloud dragon, the Avengers would have still unwittingly brought about a lot of suffering to these innocent timelines by rendering them incapable of using the stones to defend themselves. Many of these questions could be answered if Endgame more definitively explained how time travel works in the MCU, but it's clear to me that the rules were left vague on purpose. Nevertheless, the time travel rules the film establishes in Act 1 are explicitly contradicted in Act 2. This is the consequence of impressively incompetent writing. When Bruce meets the Ancient One in 2012 New York, she states that the removal of an Infinity Stone from the past is the catalyst for the creation of a new timeline, not the act of time travel itself, or seemingly even the act of directly influencing the past. The logic here is that if the Avengers return the stones after using them, no new timelines will be created. I use the word logic loosely, what with that being, you know, completely fucking illogical. Captain America didn't fight a future version of himself and fall down a flight of stairs in the main timeline. Peter Quill didn't get knocked out on Morag in the main timeline. Thanos exists after 2014 in the main timeline. Timeline. The Ancient One's explanation is still not an explanation. If this represented the full extent of Endgame's time travel mishaps, it still might have functioned as a time travel story. Maybe. The heroes would still be incredibly irresponsible for recklessly screwing around in alternative realities, but the existence of these new timelines could have at least explained why changing the past didn't change their present. But then Captain America went back in time and got old. This unassuming scene single-handedly obliterates the time travel mechanics of Endgame. The Avengers didn't go to or create alternate timelines. They directly influenced the past which created them because Cap went back in time and never returned to the present via the time machine yet still exists in the same universe. He was always there, which means that everything the Avengers did in the past occurred within their own universe, which cannot be the case if the present they returned to was unchanged. So yeah, it's, it's over. The time travel scenes in this film make zero fucking sense. No, Cap traveled to a different timeline and came back to give Sam the shield. Look here, look, listen. Bruce says that Cap flew past his time code, which means he did not use the time machine to get back to the present. God, even with only a few minutes of runtime left to spare, Endgame keeps trucking on ahead and breaking itself in new and creative ways. You have to return the stones to the exact moment you got them, you're gonna open up a bunch of nasty alternative realities. Right, on several occasions, the film explicitly states that these stones must be returned to the exact moment they were taken from. This is very impossible for several reasons. I'm curious to see how Cap managed to return these stones to where they came from. I guess he held Jane down and injected her with the ether again. That's nice. I suppose he flew back to Vormir and dropped the soul stone in a puddle. I imagine bumping into Red Skull all the way out there probably came as a bit of a surprise to him. The space stone can only be accessed by destroying the Tesseract, and the space stone was retrieved from the 1970s as the Tesseract. So how exactly does Steve return the Tesseract to where he got it from? And follow-up question, how does the past progress precisely the same way as it did originally if the Tesseract doesn't exist? That's a rhetorical question, obviously. The answer is that it can't. By the way, here's something a little awkward to ponder. I'm gonna go ahead and assume that duplicate stones existing concurrently are going to mess with the fabric of reality, what with the fact that they control it. Cap has all six Infinity Stones in a briefcase at the same time time. How can he return each stone to where they came from when they were removed from the past at different times? Again, rhetorical question, the answer is that he can't. There will always be duplicate stones unless he makes round trips, which we know that he didn't. Oh, and by the way, to reiterate the point once again, these timelines are beyond salvation. Thanos doesn't exist anymore in the 2014 timeline, so that one's been permanently altered. The 2012 timeline has been changed substantially because Loki escaped with the Tesseract. 
The 1970 timeline has been changed substantially because the Tesseract no longer exists as a cube, and even the 2013 timeline has probably changed owing to Jane Foster having the ether sucked out of her and I guess put back in by Cap. Do you understand how nonsensical this all is? What I find frustrating about trying to broach this subject is that I know there'll be people scrambling to argue that subsequent stories will address these issues, as though that's a meaningful response to anything that's just been said. Besides, Loki tried and failed to address these questions, all the while creating brand new problems like a complete absence of free will in the MCU, or this completely bullshit idea that it's possible to screw with the past in ways which don't create tangential timelines because the change being affected on the world isn't substantial enough. Avengers Endgame serves as the finale of the Infinity Saga, so I think it's perfectly fair to assess the film with reference only to what came before rather than what comes after. This film was supposed to provide answers, not generate new questions for subsequent stories to address. The time travel in Avengers Endgame just fucking sucks. So Back to the Future is a bunch of bullshit? Yeah, you can fuck yourself. So, the time heist is the plan the Avengers concocted to retrieve all six Infinity Stones from the past. After spending some time brainstorming ideas, the team arrived on a very smart and not at all stupid plan. Tony, Steve, Scott, and Bruce will return to New York in 2012 and grab the Space Stone, Mind Stone, and Time Stone. Thor and Rocket will return to Asgard in 2013 and grab the Reality Stone. And Rhodey, Nebula, Natasha, and Clint will return to more and Vormir in 2014 and grab the Power Stone and Soul Stone. The team also concludes that they have one shot to get the stones because they only have enough Pym Particles for a single round trip. Does that make sense to you? It shouldn't! Am I to believe that during the planning phase, not one person raised their hand and asked, uh, can we just go back in time and get some more Pym Particles? I feel like that's one of the first questions any reasonably intelligent person would have. The time heist almost failed because the Avengers didn't have any spare Pym Particles. Even if we were to assume that it was impossible for the Avengers to get more Pym Particles, the plan they settled on is asinine. The Avengers could have picked several better moments in the past from which to retrieve the stones. They should have gone back to Thanos' garden hut and cut off his hand before he destroyed the stones. That would have given them all six in one foul swoop. One might say that plan is a little risky. And you're right, it is a little risky. Not quite as risky as going to three different timelines, thereby giving you only one chance to get the stones but still risky nonetheless. A somewhat safer option would have been to go back to Wakanda in 2018 to kill Thanos before he removed the Mind Stone from Vision. That would have given them five stones immediately and all six after allowing Shuri to safely remove the Mind Stone from Vision's head. The Avengers also could have gone back to Titan in 2018 and knocked Quill out while Tony and Peter were removing the Gauntlet from Thanos. That would have delivered them four stones and even if Doctor Strange proved uncooperative, they simply could take those four stones back to the future and gather the remaining two from different points in the past. Even if one were to insist that all these proposals are too risky, I'd like to highlight just how risky it was for the Avengers to send their entire team back to the past, thereby rendering it impossible for them to try again if any one group failed at their mission. Sorry, I, I, I can't stand it any longer. This whole plan is insane. Insane, I tell you. All right, class two is in session. Basic mathematics with Professor Fringy. 10 people are sent back in time with enough pimp particles to return to the present. So it's safe to conclude that there are 20 Pym Particle canisters available to the Avengers. One round trip requires at least two canisters. Why at least two? Well, traveling to two different points in the past and returning safely requires three canisters as you only need one to move between two points in the past. Traveling to three different points in time requires only four. So, as you can see, it's more efficient to send one person to several different points in time than it is to send several people to one point in time each. This is a surprisingly important detail to remember because what it tells us with absolute certainty is that even if the Avengers didn't think to get more Pym Particles from the past, and even if the Avengers felt it was too risky to retrieve all the stones from Thanos himself, they still settled on the least efficient plan possible. Sending everybody back in time 
time means that even a single mistake derails the whole mission, as was almost the case with the Tesseract in 2012 New York. Conversely, if the Avengers were to send a team of, say, five people back in time, all five of those people could have traveled to the three chosen points in time and returned safely, or alternatively, one person could have dropped off at each jump with the stones in tow, meaning there would still be at least enough pin particles left for one person to go back in time and return safely if anything went wrong. The time heist represents Endgame quite well if you ask me. It is so poorly conceived. To be clear, it's not strictly a problem that characters in a story don't make the most optimal decisions. However, when characters who are supposed to be incredibly smart make the absolute worst decisions possible, we're no longer dealing with an understandable lapse in judgment. The time heist the Avengers settled on is perhaps one of the dumbest ways in which they could have gone about getting the stones. But it was the best way if the goals of the writers were to have the second act of this film operate as a nostalgic highlight reel. The time heist is one of the clearest cut examples of pandering winning out over logic that I have ever seen. Speaking of which... The Ride of the Rahiram is an excellent scene, so I can completely understand why the Russo brothers would want to emulate it with the final battle in Endgame. That said, I feel it's important to mention that the Lord of the Rings is based on the medieval period. You know, a, a time when air support, tanks, and artillery pieces didn't exist. Epic charges are cool and all, but when you have access to guns and the primary mode of attack available to your adversaries is punching and biting, a full frontal melee oriented assault is pretty fucking stupid. Why do I get the distinct impression that any modern military could have obliterated Thanos' army in less than 10 minutes? I feel like one enemy would get the job done. But uh, nah, fuck that. Let's charge the enemy line, guys. We don't need M1 Abrams and F-15s to fight space dogs. We've got weapons from the fucking Neolithic period. It's like deploying kamikaze pilots against an army of beached tuna. The seagulls in Finding Nemo demonstrated superior tactical acumen than the Avengers. I feel compelled to once again reiterate that several members of the Avengers are supposed to be among the smartest people on Earth. The battle begins with 2014 Thanos rolling up on Avengers HQ with his giant spaceship. The only reason why this is possible is because 2023 Nebula allowed herself to be captured by Thanos, who then tasked 2014 Nebula with infiltrating the Avengers and using their time machine to pull him into the future. But had Nebula just teleported back to the present, the second she realized that something was wrong, that would have been the end of it. Thanos wouldn't have been able to travel into the future and retrieve the gauntlet. She was already about to leave. What in the hell was she doing? But in any case, 2014 Nebula boots up the time machine and Thanos' massive ship arrives in the present. And by arrives, I mean punches a giant hole in the roof of Avengers HQ. Am I to believe that Avengers HQ doesn't have an early warning system or a security protocol which can't detect that the ceiling is gone? Remember that time when the Avengers HQ early warning system which definitely exists was so advanced that it could detect some fucking ants on the roof? Thanos then blows up Avengers HQ, thereby conveniently incapacitating everybody except Iron Man, Captain America, and Thor. They fight for a it. Cap picks up Mjolnir, everybody cheers, and then he gets the shit kicked out of him. For a moment, it seems all hope is lost, until a whole host of portals open and tens of thousands of soldiers hailing from across the Marvel Universe filter in to stop Thanos. I wonder how Doctor Strange managed to assemble such a formidable fighting force so quickly. Even with Wong's help, he only had about five minutes to work with. And in that time, he amassed thousands of sorcerers, Asgardians, Wakandans, and... Ravages? What exactly did he tell these people? Were they all just sitting around ready for battle? The Wakandans I can see, but the Asgardians? Did they have their armor and weaponry sitting next to their PlayStations? Also, if Bruce only brought back the people who were snapped, that means half the Asgardians and a good number of the Wakandans are still dead. Yet there are thousands of them spilling through these portals. And by the way, if Thanos wasn't such a brain-dead sea cucumber, he might have thought it wise to rain fire on these guys 
realized while they were assembling, instead of much later in the battle, when his own forces were vulnerable to friendly fire. This one is very much a nitpick, but if the sun is setting on the east coast of the United States, why is the sun also setting or rising in Africa? What is this place, Tatooine? All right, nitpicking over. Now for the really stupid shit. The struggle for the gauntlets might be one of the most contrived sequences in the history of superhero cinema. The only reason why it happened is because characters who were supposed to be intelligent consistently made terrible decisions. It exists purely for the sake of tension and to culminate in Tony using the Infinity Stones to dust Thanos and his army. This film simply doesn't care to acknowledge that the Avengers have a significant advantage over Thanos in this battle. Doctor Strange is on the side of the good guys. Why doesn't he trap Thanos in the mirror dimension? Ant-Man is on the side of the good guys. Why doesn't he crush Thanos under his boot? Thor is on the side of the good guys. Why doesn't he throw Stormbreaker at Thanos like he did last time? Or am I to believe that's no longer possible because he's fat? You know, perhaps I'm being too harsh. Maybe they didn't have enough time to mull over these ideas. After all, they were too busy collectively agreeing to deliver the gauntlet to Thanos. Cap! What do you want me to do with this damn thing? Get those stones as far away as possible! No! We need to get up back where they came from. Oh. I'm sorry, but this is just stupid. The Avengers should have gotten the gauntlet the fuck out of there. Removing the stones from the battle was inarguably the smartest thing they could have done, and it's not as though this would have been that difficult for them to do. Half the team were qualified to do this. The number of means by which the gauntlet could have been taken away is honestly laughable. Give the gauntlet to Thor and have him bifrost out of there like he bifrosted himself into Wakanda. Give the gauntlet to Doctor Strange and have him open a portal to fucking, I don't know, Tahiti. As soon as Captain Marvel arrives on the battlefield, it's over. She can fly at light speed, which isn't fast enough to travel the cosmos efficiently, but it is fast enough to get the gauntlet hundreds of kilometers away from the battlefield before Thanos could even blink. Instead, the Avengers decide that it would be a good idea to use the time machine in the van to get the gauntlet to the past. The van, which just so happens to be deep behind enemy lines. I gotta say, I feel like the strategy of put that thing back where it came from also help me doesn't make a lot of sense sense here. First and foremost, holy shit! Even if you didn't get the gauntlet out of there like you should have done, you guys would have been better off pitching a tent on your side of the battlefield, starting up a campfire, and roasting some infinity s'mores. That would have at least forced Thanos to come and get the stones from you instead of having them delivered to him by Captain FedEx. Second, what exactly is achieved by sending the gauntlet through the time machine? You know what, scratch that. How is it even possible for anybody to use that time machine? One needs access to a wrist-mounted device to travel back and forth in time, and Captain Marvel does not have one, nor does she have any pin particles on her person. Who in the world is Captain Marvel supposed to get back to the present after flying through the time machine? Also, does Captain Marvel know where those stones are supposed to go? She wasn't involved in the time heist, so where is she going? Where are you guys sending her. Also, numero duo, if one can enter the time machine by flying through it, couldn't Thanos just run through it after Captain Marvel? Also, numero trio, this whole scene can't play out as it does. Captain Marvel flies at light speed. It is physically impossible for Thanos to stop her from getting to the time machine. The only reason he manages to stop her is because she was flying at the top speed of a Ford Model A. Also, numero quattro, couldn't the Avengers have just destroyed the gauntlet, thereby rendering the star stones completely useless. But yeah, they could have removed the stones from the gauntlet, put each stone into its own little box, and then dispersed those stones across Earth until they defeated Thanos' army. I can't take it anymore! I just want to die! Oh, and before I forget to mention this, if power levels ever existed in the MCU, they're gone now. Reduced to fucking atoms. Maybe I was wrong to assume this, but I thought the reason why Thanos was so strong in Infinity War was because he'd acquired the Power Stone. I guess that's not the case, though, because Endgame can confirms that Thanos sands any stones can take on Iron Man, Captain America, and Thor at the same time. 
which I do not believe for a second. I'm sorry, but Thanos is dead. He's super dead. All that's left of him after this fight is a pile of purple jelly. But no, instead Thanos is somehow able to close the distance on Iron Man with his stupid spinning sword to then use Tony as a human shield to deflect Mjolnir. Despite being bedecked in a suit of armor, the impact knocks Tony unconscious when 11 years prior, the comparatively antiquated Mark VI tanked a direct hit from Mjolnir. Had Cap thought to put Mjolnir on Thanos' chest, he could have easily incapacitated Thanos, but he doesn't do that and then nearly dies. I just don't... <clears throat> Thanos, Thanos, you have two arms. Thanos, please do something with your free arm. What are you doing? Thanos, uh, you've forgotten that you have two arms. Please do. Oh, yeah, you did it. Good job. Get the fuck out of the way. I can't see. Jesus. Well, that's Tony dead. Well, if that last hit didn't do it. By the way, where is everybody? Where is Rhodey, or Pepper, or Valkyrie, or Wanda, or any number of people whose assistance would be extremely helpful in this situation? Am I really to believe this was the one conceivable way in which the Avengers defeated Thanos? You're telling me that the Avengers lost in the timeline where Captain Marvel flew the gauntlet into outer space? 14 million possibilities, and this was the only way? But can you see why I'm so fucking angry? Fuck yeah! Look, I get it, okay? It's cool to see a whole bunch of superheroes on screen at the same time working together to stop the bad guys. It's neat, and it's exciting, but it's also stupid. It's recognizable iconography in exchange for true narrative potency. The opening charge at the Battle of the Black Gate is an example of a charge working on both levels. On a surface level, it's epic as all hell, but it's the underlying story that really makes it so. It's the last stand for our heroes. A final act of courage predicated on the belief that the day will be won, and that even if it's not, at least they stood defiant against pure evil. It's on character, it's on theme, and from a plot perspective, it functions well. Grand spectacles and good storytelling are not mutually exclusive, but if one must be lost, I'd like to think the latter would be the one left standing. It doesn't feel that way sometimes. Do you remember strategy? All right, listen up. Until we can close that portal, our priority is containment. Martin, I want you on that roof. Eyes on everything. Call out patterns and strays. Stark, you got the perimeter. Thor, you gotta try and bottleneck that portal. Slow him down. You and me, we stay here on the ground. We keep the fighting here. And Hulk. <sighs> Smash. Ah, <sighs> I miss strategy. You may have noticed that, thus far, I've dedicated a very small amount of time to the characters of Avengers Endgame. That was on purpose. Why? Well, it's because, difficult as this may be to believe given everything we've discussed, I'm more than willing to look past plot holes and contrivances even significant ones, if the characters are still great, because character is at the heart of storytelling. The reason why the Marvel Cinematic Universe has been so remarkably successful is because it used to have good characters. The MCU's strengths are not to be found in its world building, as paradoxical as that may seem. The world building in this series has typically been weak, with standalone films routinely failing to adequately acknowledge the broader universe they belong to. Thoughts such as, why isn't Iron Man helping Cap take down the Hydra helicarriers? come to mind. Plotting has also been a persistent issue with few exceptions. The films in this series with sound plots are greatly outnumbered by the mediocre, bad, and downright terrible. However, the characters, namely the heroes, but also a handful of villains, have consistently managed to pick up the slack. If the MCU didn't have the likes of Tony Stark, Steve Rogers, or Peter Quill, this series would be much harder to distinguish from the DCEU which has similar world-building problems, but was also completely devoid of any worthwhile characters up until the release of The Suicide Squad. Even when things weren't making complete sense, there was often good drama to be found within the MCU's better films. Iron Man, The Avengers, Guardians of the Galaxy, Civil War, Homecoming, all these films make great use of their protagonists, with the latter two also superbly utilizing their respective villains and the world in which they took place. And so really, it's no wonder why 
people like the MCU, though the films have varied wildly in quality. When you look back on this series, it seems as though we were heading someplace great, where a decade's worth of work and character development would fully pay off. And the reason why it was easy to think this is because coming into Endgame, several characters were well positioned for great send-offs, and they screwed it all up. I'm gonna take a moment to preface my criticisms of the character writing in Endgame, since I expect these to comprise the most contentious part of my critique. When it comes to analyzing stories, character can be a complicated beast. I think we're often quick to assume that character and plot are separate components because what they ultimately represent is quite different. The plot is simply what happens, while characters are the conduit between text and subtext. The sequence sequence of events and the emotional value of the narrative. But character and plot are often intertwined. Plot issues may stem from the decisions characters make, or alternatively, gaps in a story's logic may result in characters making decisions which don't seem congruent with their beliefs. For instance, it's a plot issue that the Avengers didn't contact any government bodies when devising and executing the time heist. But it's also an issue which damages the characters, since the Avengers absolutely would have told the governments of the world what they were doing. Plot problems can easily create inconsistencies in characters. Character payoffs are what most of us are here for. That's the really potent stuff we're all looking to see. However, character payoffs do not exist in isolation. The best stories with the most compelling characters achieve their emotional highs whilst being propped up by a sound sequence of events. I know this is an old adage, but it's a good one and highly applicable when it comes to storytelling. It's not about the destination. It's about the journey. And if weak characters are akin to houses constructed on sand, Endgame's characters are sitting atop fairy floss, dangling above a black hole. Captain America was assassinated in Endgame, and you cannot convince me otherwise. The reason why I'm so confidently stating this is because Steve is acting largely out of character in this film. And I'm not just talking about the stupid decisions this otherwise intelligent person keeps making. No, that's an issue which affects almost everybody in this film. Instead, I'd like to focus on the decisions Steve makes which completely betrays his core principles in favor of a cheap and emotional emotionally manipulative payoff. Steve has consistently demonstrated himself to be a man willing to lay down his life if it means saving the world, if it means saving one person. He is fiercely loyal to his friends, to an almost self-destructive degree. Time and time again, we've seen that Steve would sooner die than willingly hurt his friends, even when that means dealing irreparable damage to his other relationships. This loyalty could be tied to what I think is Steve's core trait. The one which permeates his entire arc and made him one of my favorite characters in the MCU. Steve is steadfastly principled. He doesn't compromise on his beliefs, even when doing so comes at great personal expense. Given all that, I do not believe Captain America would abandon his friends and his responsibilities in the presence because he wants to go on a date with Peggy. Now, one might say, but Captain America has done so much for everybody else. He deserves a good life. You may think Steve deserves a good life with Peggy, and you're probably right, but that is completely irrelevant. It's not about whether other people believe that Steve has earned the right to retire, but rather whether Steve himself believes he's earned the right to retire. Steve does not strike me as the kind of person who believes that his responsibilities would ever come to an end. I really feel like his sense of obligation to the world, and perhaps still to Erskine, would compel him to remain involved in the ongoing affairs of humanity. He's shown himself to be that kind of person throughout the MCU. He doesn't sit fights out. And by returning to the past, Steve is sitting out every fight yet to come. Well, there is plenty of other people who can deal with those threats now. Does that sound like something Steve would ever say? Look, I want to eat ice cream and watch romantic comedies with Peggy. You guys can handle this one, right? In universe, there's no reason to believe that there will never again be a Thanos level threat against which Steve could prove pivotal. The only reason why we as an audience think otherwise is because the film is called Avengers Endgame. Steve doesn't give up. 
ever. Endgame itself reinforces this aspect of his character with Steve's unwillingness to move on from the snap. Unfortunately, the film trips over at the finish line. I'll say it again. Steve does not quit. I can do this all day. I can do this all day. I can do this all day. Here's a real hot take for you. I don't think Peggy is all that important to Steve's arc by comparison to Bucky. To be clear, Peggy is important. She plays a significant role in each of Cap's solo outings, but it all leads to one place. Steve moving on from her, and by extension, the past. Much of the turmoil Steve faces throughout his journey stems from his coming to grips with the world he now finds himself in. There are plenty of references to support this idea. In Avengers, Steve is very much a man out of time. He's yet to find his place in the modern world. Sure, he may have taken on the role of de facto leader of the Avengers, but the team disperses after the Chitauri threat is dealt with. As we discover in The Winter Soldier, Steve still feels out of place. His prior convictions are being challenged. The world is a little more complicated than he remembers it to be. There's not much tethering him to the past until Bucky comes into play, and he's a totally different person thanks to Hydra's brainwashing. However, by the end of Age of Ultron, we receive a clearer indication of where Cap's journey in Phase 2 had ultimately led him. Maybe I should take a page out of Barton's book, Build Pepper a Farm. A simple life. You get there one day. I don't know. Family. Stability. Guy who wanted all that went in the ice 75 years ago. I think someone else came out. You may retort, but Steve said he wanted to try out the life Tony suggested. And to that, I would say... Bullshit! <laughs> Peggy means a lot to Steve, but he's absolutely moved on from her. His priorities changed over the course of his arc from Peggy to his place in the modern world, mainly leading the Avengers and pulling Bucky back from the abyss. Those are his priorities. The Peggy stuff comes out of nowhere in Endgame, and considering what happens with Sharon Carter in Civil War, this feels a little weird. Let's talk about Bucky, by the way. Steve's relationship with Bucky is at the core of his journey. Bucky is always stuck by Steve, so Steve feels compelled to always stick by Bucky, even though doing so mostly costs him. But Steve, as always, puts it best. I'm not gonna fight you. You're my friend. <laughs> <laughs> Finish it, because I'm with you to the end of the line. Endgame isn't the end of the line for Bucky. He's still got a lot of life left to live, and as we learn in The Falcon and the Winter Soldier, plenty of trauma left to reconcile. Now, he does get over it, in a very sloppy and unsatisfying way, I might add. But you can't honestly tell me that Steve being around wouldn't have helped a little bit. But fuck it, right? That's Bucky's problem. Steve wants to watch Seinfeld with Peggy. I don't believe that Steve would abandon Bucky. He's never abandoned him before, and there was no reason to believe that Bucky was going to be A-OK -okay on his own just because Wakanda got the codes out of his head. You know, I think the scene where Cap hands the shield to Sam is emblematic of what's wrong with this film. I like this scene a lot. I was personally okay with Sam getting the shield, and I especially like that he says he'll do his best to honor its legacy. It's a neat scene, but only if you don't think about it, because the second you do, it completely falls apart. The scene is enabled through the breaching of the time travel rules the film itself sets out, and it deals significant damage to Steve's character because the decision which brought him here isn't one the hero whom we came to know would have made. Steve's character is damaged by Endgame, quite significantly I would say. Now, I want to talk about Tony next, and what I have to say surprises even me. But before we can do that, we need to have a little chat about the snap and its consequences on the world. The writers of Avengers Endgame and all the MCU films following it clearly don't want to grapple with the true consequences of the snap. Probably because they aren't 
pleasant. Allow me to explain to you how Earth functions. The world we currently live in has been purposely designed to accommodate all 7 billion of us. It's a world which we've incrementally constructed in conjunction with population growth and technological advancement. In some ways it's held together by duct tape, but that's okay so long as nothing too catastrophic happens and provided there are enough people with the right skills to restore order to society. Throughout history, every sharp decrease in the Earth's population has had significant consequences. From the Black Death to World War II, the marks these events left on the world are evident to this day. Now imagine what would happen if half of the world's leaders, politicians, police officers, doctors, firefighters, soldiers, engineers, bankers, scientists, teachers, construction workers all disappeared in an instant without any warning whatsoever. If this were to ever happen, the world would be completely fucked. It would be the most cataclysmic event to have ever happened in the history of mankind. More terrifying than the most devastating of plagues, worse than the most catastrophic of conflicts. The snap would be game over for humanity, or at least society as we know it. Even if we were to assume that the world didn't completely descend into chaos, the snap would still leave a lot of carnage in its wake. Let's talk about snap adjacent deaths. If half of the world's population were to cease existing at the same time, a lot of people who didn't get snapped are still going to die. Some planes would be left without pilots, trains without conductors, and cars without drivers. So yeah, lots of dead people within the first hour of the snap. Many governments will collapse very quickly given that half the politicians, generals, and judges won't exist anymore. Coups and insurrections are sure to sweep the planet along with a few genocides for good measure. And if this sudden decrease in the world's population doesn't spark any major wars, which it absolutely would, a lot of people are bound to die from the smaller conflicts which will ravage Earth, let alone all the other inhabited planets in the universe. Then come the suicides. There would be plenty of people who couldn't deal with half the universe being deleted from existence. Putting to one side the existential dread the snap would unleash upon the world, think about all the people who would be completely overcome by grief and despair. Parents who have lost all their children spring to mind, but there'd be others too, like the people who lose their jobs and their homes in the ensuing economic crisis which would make the Great Depression look like a shitty day at the dog track. Hundreds of thousands of snap adjacent deaths on Earth alone would be a conservative estimate. If we we're being honest with ourselves, it would probably be millions. And if we factor in the rest of the universe, we're talking trillions of deaths. How many more people do you think will die after half the universe's population is suddenly snapped back into existence without warning? Endgame and Far From Home tell us that those who were snapped are brought back to the place they were originally. Now, this is a nitpick, but I'm in a nitpicky mood. Planets move. Unless the stones are so intuitive that they can recognize what planets are, everybody is getting resurrected into the vacuum of space. Let's be charitable to the movie and assume that the stones simply snap you to the location where you were relative to the planet you were on. Lots of people are still gonna die. If you got snapped while you were on a plane, you're gonna plummet to your death. If you got snapped while driving on the freeway, you're gonna get run over by a truck. If you got snapped while you were receiving open heart surgery, you're gonna pop back into existence with an exposed abdomen. This is all assuming you weren't popped through another human being who just so happened to be standing where you were or a wall. But forget all that noise, this is where the fun begins. The biggest humanitarian crisis in human history, courtesy of the Avengers. Where the hell do I begin with this? For starters, there won't be enough food for everybody, so millions of people are gonna starve to death, especially in developing countries, and the essential services which we dial down in scale will have to be rapidly expanded to account for billions of previously dead people. Power outages, water shortages, you name it, it, there won't be enough of it. Thanks to Falcon and the Winter Soldier, we know that several sovereign states cease to exist in the wake of the snap, so that means we'll have millions of stateless people to resettle. Oh yeah, and expect homelessness to skyrocket, and with it, a lot more deaths owing to violence, drug addiction, and suicide. So, we'll have to add all those deaths to the tally. The snap and the blip collectively will result in the deaths of millions of people on Earth alone. One could say that simply bringing everybody back and nothing more is astoundingly naive and arguably downright negligent. 
And yet, that's what the Avengers did. Because Tony wanted to save his daughter. His daughter's welfare mattered more to him than the welfare of trillions of sentient beings. Yeah, there's a problem here. Tony Stark is an excellent character, and the MCU wouldn't be what it is without him. Tony's arc in this series epitomizes the strengths of this storytelling format. This is a character who has been thoroughly explored, every flaw exposed, every triumph exalted. He's been steadily chipped away at over the course of a decade, leaving us with an incredibly well-defined hero whose growth feels truly earned. Tony's trajectory in the MCU was always leading to an ultimate sacrifice. And what a sacrifice it was. Tony's death marks the emotional high point of Endgame. This scene is riveting and superbly performed. I don't take any issue with this part of the film. I do take issue with everything leading up to it. Tony's unwillingness to consider that being a hero might mean giving up the life that he's built is not something I would consider to be character assassination, but it is nonetheless frustrating for several reasons. First, I think it is highly questionable that Tony would immediately write off the idea of using the stones to rewind time to before the snap. I'm not saying that reversing time is the decision which would make everybody happy. And I'm not saying that it's easy to choose between your family and other people, but to coin a phrase from Tony himself, that's part of the hero gig. And Tony's been doing the whole hero thing for a while. I don't believe that the Tony we know would so readily dismiss the idea that saving the world might mean sacrificing the life he's built for himself. One might argue that Tony believes his decision will yield the best results for the most people. But not only do I seriously doubt that to be true, this is simply not the reasoning Tony provides to Steve. We got a shot at getting these stones, but I got to tell you my priorities. Bring back what we lost, I hope, yes. Keep what I found, have to, at all costs. And maybe not die trying. Sounds like a deal. Tony will not help the Avengers if doing so has the potential to cost him anything. That's his reasoning, and it seems inconsistent with who I understood Tony to be. Second, and perhaps more importantly, this issue is never raised with the rest of the team or debated in any meaningful way. The decision to bring everybody back without undoing the prior five years was an executive decision made by Tony and Steve, which was the very thing Tony took issue with in Captain America Civil War, so I guess he's just completely backflipped on that position, I do not believe for a second that not one member of the Avengers pushed back against simply bringing everybody back rather than reversing time. Steve seems to be cool with it, which is concerning, but it's not just their decision. The rest of the team goes along with it too. It's irksome to me that Tony is only willing to help on the condition that he gets to keep his family and that nobody found that to be even remotely questionable. So in a sense, my issue isn't with the decision itself, though I don't know that I can fully accept that choice as being in character, but rather with the reasoning behind his decision and his refusal to help on any terms other than his own. That seems wrong to me given what Tony's arc up until that point was all about. For those of you who are rearing up to respond to these points, you can't because third and most importantly, there is no reason to believe that the stones can't be used to simultaneously reverse time and bring the people who were born during that five year period along for the ride, as well as any people who were killed during those intervening years. If I'm to believe that such a prospect is so unreasonable that the Avengers wouldn't have even considered it, then the time heist is unreasonable because the Avengers couldn't have been so confident that traveling back in time wouldn't have deleted them from existence, that they were even capable of building a working gauntlet, and that using the gauntlet to resurrect the dead was even possible. The Avengers weren't working with any time constraints. They had all the time they needed to sit down and formulate a solution to the snap which would yield the best results for the most people. Not everybody is going to be happy with whatever decision the Avengers made, whether that be simply bringing everybody back, 
reversing time, or snapping everybody back, including the people who were born and died in the intervening years. However, I would argue that the choice they made was close to the worst one, given the roll-on effects of bringing billions of people back into existence in an instant without warning. And the only reason they did that is because Tony wanted to protect himself to the exclusion of everybody else. That's kind of selfish given the circumstances. I will say that I do like the family stuff in this film. I think Tony's relationship with Pepper has always been well written, and the presence of Morgan in this story brought out a side of Tony we've never seen before. I don't think this material is any less meaningful if Tony's sacrifice entailed the erasure of it from the timeline. It still happened to him, and it would have continued mattering to him even if it were undone. And that's assuming the Stones don't have the power to change reality in ways which could keep the family around. Besides, these these aren't the only storytelling choices at the disposal of the writers. All in all, I think it's totally fair to question if Tony would make the choice that he did, whether you believe he'd value his family over the welfare of trillions of beings or not. But it's completely absurd to suggest that he wouldn't even try to grapple with that choice, or that none of the other Avengers took issue with his decision or the reasoning behind it. I wish this were the extent of my gripes with the characterizations of Tony and Steve in Endgame, but there is still plenty more to go over. Captain America Civil War is the best film in the MCU. In many ways, Civil War is the real Avengers 2, because unlike in Age of Ultron, meaningful character conflict rooted in the events which transpired in prior films is at the forefront of this story. The strongest of the many strong components of Civil War is the dynamic between Tony and Steve, which could be described as a microcosmic representation of the story's broader external conflict, but that wouldn't be doing it just Justice. There is much more going on with Tony and Steve than just their disagreement on the Sokovia Accords. The Accords simply brought their personal conflict to the surface. These two men began as polar opposites, and their journey up to that point had turned them into very different people who still disagreed on fundamental issues. Tony Stark began as a cocksure man of action who demonstrated a brazen disregard for the opinions of others, leading him to make some very reckless and consequential decisions which drove a wedge between him and those he cared about, and forced him to consider whether he alone has the right to make such important decisions about the security of Earth. Ultron was the consequence of Tony's cavalier attitude, one which both he and the broader world could no longer tolerate. Tony began as a man who refused to cooperate with anybody. He didn't cooperate with the US government or S.H.I.E.L.D. and was initially opposed to joining the Avengers. In Iron Man 2, he boldly proclaimed that he successfully privatized world peace. And to his credit, there was little evidence to the contrary at the time. Until a giant hole in space appeared above New York and an enormous alien armada kicked down the front door. Everything changed for Tony when he sent the nuke through the wormhole. He became cursed with knowledge. The knowledge that there were forces in the universe far greater than he could have ever comprehended. The knowledge that Earth wasn't yet ready to fend off such threats that he wasn't ready to fend off such threats. That if nothing was done to change that, everybody he cared about would perish. And so, throughout the following films, Tony's attitude shifted. He became obsessively focused on defending Earth by any means necessary, to the detriment of his own personal relationships, health, and standing within this world. Ultron was Tony's endgame a suit of armor around the world. He made an executive decision without consulting anybody on his team or any government officials. And it backfired spectacularly. The world responded to this mistake, as did Tony. There's no decision-making process here. We need to be put in check. Whatever form that takes, I'm game. If we can't accept limitations, we're boundaryless. We're no better than the bad guys. 
So, by Civil War, we've got a Tony Stark who, despite his cocksure attitude, holds a very different perspective on his role as a hero than he had at the beginning of his journey. We have a man who is willing, to some extent, to submit to other authorities, to place the power in the hands of others, to accept oversight when he would have previously dismissed such an idea on the grounds that he was the smartest man in the room. Conversely, Steve became a man who trusted in himself and his own judgment after being burned several times for doing otherwise. Steve came from humble beginnings. He was a small man with a big heart, a person who sought to do good, but lacked the means to fight the bullies. Erskine bestowed him with the power to do that which he sought, but urged him to retain his heart. And he did. He fought the bullies and saved the day. But when he came out of the ice 75 years after the conclusion of World War II, the world he knew was gone, and the things he believed to be obviously true came into question. Steve could no longer blindly trust authority after discovering that Hydra had infiltrated S.H.I.E.L.D. It became necessary for him to refuse to follow orders and begin issuing his own. After all, Steve's motives are honorable. He can trust in himself to do the right thing. He changed from a poster boy for the United States Army, a conventional good guy who followed orders and fought the obvious bad guys, into a person who trusted in his own conviction to the exclusion of all others, including government and military institutions. This is the United Nations we're talking about. It's not the World Security Council. It's not S.H.I.E.L.D. It's not Hydra. No, but it's run by people with agendas, and agendas change. That's good. When I realized what my weapons were capable of in the wrong hands, I shut it down and stopped manufacturing. Tony, you chose to do that. If we sign this, we surrender our right to choose. We may not be perfect, but the safest hands are still our own. And entering into Civil War, we find that Tony and Steve have essentially fallen into opposing camps again. And on this issue, there was only one side which could win, and Tony won, because of course he did. The world was on his side. Nevertheless, Steve didn't relent, because he's not the kind to relent, especially when his friend's life was on the line. The result of Civil War was the fracturing of the Avengers, and Infinity War was the consequence. Steve wasn't there, the Avengers had been weakened, and thus Earth was left vulnerable. Had the team still been together, there's a good chance that Thanos would have been defeated then and there. In fact, it's almost a certainty considering Thanos was nearly defeated on Titan. Steve made a significant decision, one which he believed to be consistent with his principles. And that's great, that's good character writing, but it cost the Avengers big time because Tony was right. Steve's decision to not sign the Accords was an ultimately futile act of defiance against a world which was demanding accountability from the Avengers. Couple this with the Winter Soldier secret Steve kept from Tony, and going into Endgame, the writers had great interpersonal drama to work with. One of the few outright great scenes in Endgame is the argument between Tony and Steve about the fallout of Civil War. I saw this coming a few years back. I had a vision, I didn't want to believe it. Tony, I'm gonna need you to focus. And I needed you, as in past tense, that trumps what you need. It's too late, buddy. And I believe I remember telling Tony, oh, yes. Tony. that what we needed was a pseudo armor around the world. Remember that? Whether it impacted our precious freedoms or not, that's what we needed. I got nothing for you, Cap. I got no coordinates, no clues, no strategies, no options, zero, zip, nada. No trust. This is great stuff. Unfortunately, this is all the stuff. The conflict is relegated exclusively to these opening minutes. The next time we see Tony and Steve together, their relationship is peachy. No bitterness, no further arguments, no butting of heads. All is forgiven when all should not be forgiven. Tony should still be furious with Steve, and Steve should either be reconsidering his stance or affirming his stance. There is still more that needs to be discussed between these two, bridges which need repairing. And all that potentially great drama is tossed aside in favor of a stupid fucking time heist. I cannot believe how squandered Civil War was. <sighs> Speaking of squandered, 
Thor has been on quite the journey, hasn't he? It's mostly been not all that impressive, <laughs> but for a little while, I was quite invested in the God of Thunder. With Ragnarok and Infinity War, Thor ascended my list of favorite MCU characters in shockingly quick time. He was the surprise standout of Infinity War, as far as I'm concerned. And with such a dark ending to cap off what had been a very trying time for the character, his trajectory was downright exciting. I was eager to see what end game would do with Thor- <laughs> What the fuck have you done?! Fat Thor was a mistake. Thor is far from a static character. Of all the main Avengers, he's probably retained the fewest of his starting traits. However, for as much as Thor has changed, I don't subscribe to the notion that Ragnarok turned him into a completely different character. Thor Ragnarok is an uproariously funny comedy, and this naturally meant that Thor himself became funnier than he'd ever been before. But believe it or not, Ragnarok does have a theme. Thor went on an arc in that film, one which is congruous with his journey up until that point. I choose to run toward my problems and not away from them, because that's what heroes do. Thor Ragnarok could be described as a story about responsibility, specifically Thor's responsibilities to Asgard. But I also think Ragnarok is a story about identity. Who is Thor? What makes Thor a hero? What is he fighting for? Is he fighting for a place called Asgard? Or is he fighting for something more abstract? A people? For example, are you Thor, the god of hammers? Hmm? It's too late, she's already taken Asgard. Asgard is not a place, never was. Asgard is where our people stand. Even now, those people need your help. I'm not as strong as you. No. You're stronger. By Ragnarok's conclusion, Thor had become more powerful than he'd ever been before. Partly because he'd shed a lot of preconceived notions about what it means to be Thor. To be a hero and a king. It's good stuff, even if it's not strictly the focus of the film. Infinity War, however, serves as a vehicle for the most significant development Thor has received in the MCU. We see that many of the losses he suffered are beginning to have an impact on him. We discover that he's not as impenetrable as he may seem. You sure you're up to this particular motor mission? Absolutely. Loss, regret, they're all tremendous motivators. They really clear the mind, so I'm, I'm good to go. And I'm getting a new hammer, don't forget. Well, there better be some hammer. You know, I'm 1,500 years old. I'm only alive because fate wants me alive. Thanos is just the latest in a long line of bastards, and he'll be the latest to fill my vengeance. Fate wills it so. And what if you're wrong? Well, if I'm wrong, then what more could I lose? Nevertheless, Thor presses onward, determined to exact vengeance against Thanos. But it's clear that he's refusing to confront unresolved trauma, and Thanos' survival at the end of the film robs him of what he thought would make things right, would make him feel better about himself. Now... One might say it's plausible that these events could have turned somebody like Thor into a drunken hermit, and yeah, it's plausible, but it's also shit. Thor is made a mockery of in Endgame in much the same way Tony was in Iron Man 3. His depression isn't taken seriously by the film. His fall isn't presented as sad, but rather amusing. It's supposed to be hilarious that Thor has turned into a fat drunk instead of upsetting. It's supposed to be chuckle-worthy that Thor is in no position to help either his people or the Avengers. Isn't it funny that a man who lost everything has utterly crumbled under the pressure. What do, you, what do you think is coursing through my veins right now? Cheese whiz. <laughs> Ramen! Are you sleeping, you fat no. fuck? Chris Hemsworth has proven himself to be an exceptionally talented comedic actor, but his performance in Infinity War also proves that he's just a downright great performer. He was put to the test in that film, and he nailed it. Thor comes across as vulnerable, but determined. Hurting, but devoted. Wrought with pain, yet fueled by said pain to really lay the smack down on Thanos. But he failed and that would be sure to weigh on him. Now, as a writer, 
You could have Thor crumble and turn into a hermit who yells at kids over Xbox Live, or you could send him down a darker and potentially more potent path. If there's one consistent through line tethering all of Thor's stories together, it's personal responsibility. Thor will inevitably become the king of Asgard, and to be a good king, Thor must change. He must become less prideful and more devoted to the people of Asgard, just like Odin. By the end of Ragnarok, Thor has found his place and knows what he needs to do. But then, one day later, Asgard's people are annihilated. Thor is completely alone. He's lost everybody. I could easily see a man who suffered such tremendous loss become fueled by revenge, and who having recently discovered the sheer breadth of his powers would want to ensure that he doesn't fail again. I can believe that man would do whatever it takes to stop Thanos, even if it meant crossing some rather disconcerting lines. They should have written Dark Thor instead of Fat Thor. What a fucking waste. Damn. <laughs> Professor Hulk utterly baffles me. Wait, sorry. <laughs> Smart Hulk. <laughs> I laugh because that's a fucking joke. Of all the founding Avengers, Bruce has arguably seen the least development, bar maybe Clint. It's not that he's a bad character, he's just very static by comparison to the rest of the ensemble. Underutilized, one might say. And it's not as though the story of Bruce Banner isn't rich. A docile scientist who, when infuriated, transforms into an unstoppable mass of pure rage? That's an idea begging to be tapped. Unfortunately, whether due to a lack of inspiration or legal shenanigans relating to the character's film rights, Hulk basically got demoted to a supporting character. He's simply not on the same level as Iron Man, Cap, and Thor. That was still no excuse to relegate Bruce's most significant development throughout this whole series to one line of dialogue. Infinity War left Bruce in an interesting place. Both Hulk and Bruce lost. The reasons for this are debatable, but one such reason could be that they simply failed to cooperate with one another. They were always fighting one another. They viewed the other as a curse. You can do a lot with this premise. Professor Hulk is the end point of this arc, but we didn't see the arc itself. That got skipped over, leaving us with a payoff that isn't worth shit. Have any of you seen the deleted scene from Infinity War where Bruce and Hulk finally decide to work together? If you're gonna appear at any moment, now would be a hell of a good time. No! They don't only want Hulk for fighting! So what? Better hate Hulk! I don't hate you! You're more of an Avenger than I am! Hulk just wanna live! I wanna live too, man! So let's live! We'll live and let live! Live and let live! Yes! Yes! Yeah, why in the world was this cut? Then again, I do find myself questioning whether Professor Hulk was even a necessary inclusion. It's pretty obvious that Professor Hulk exists to enable the snap which restores half the universe, but that wouldn't have been needed if Thor hadn't been turned into a joke. Professor Hulk wasn't the only choice they had, and even when going with it, they probably should have dedicated a little bit of time to explaining how it all works because Professor Hulk Hulk seems a little irksome to me. I was always under the impression that Bruce and Hulk were two distinct personalities, what with the fact that all the films confirm as much. Hulk is stupid, but he is sentient. He and Bruce are not one and the same. Professor Hulk is just Bruce, so I guess Bruce killed Hulk? First of all, that's horrible. Couldn't agree more. Hawkeye is the least damaged of the damaged characters, but he too is nonetheless damaged. I'd like to pause for a moment to ask if you're impressed by my eloquent sentences. Saying the same word three times in one sentence is what we, in the niche circle known as the geniuses of English literature, like to call big brain writing. For those of you with little dinky praying mantis brains, what I'm saying is that Hawkeye is still kind of no good. The film's opening scene with Clint is great, but just like with Bruce, we skip past the most interesting part of Clint's post-snap journey. We see him at his lowest, but we don't get to see his slow descent or even Clint fully coming to grips with the death of his own family. We don't get to see him lock horns with the rest of the team or be judged harshly for his actions either. We just skip straight from Crombopulous Ronin to the Redemption arc, and that story feels hollow because nobody had a conversation with Hawkeye about the things he's done. It's not not that he doesn't have a path to redemption, but rather that there's no acknowledgement that he needs to redeem himself. Unlike 
the sleeper star of this film. Black Widow is the best character in Endgame, and if I'm being honest, she's probably the only character who emerges from this film unscathed, despite being a supporting character. Natasha has gone on a lengthy arc, which ultimately comes full circle in this film. She's a woman with a guilty conscience who has found a sense of purpose and a family in the Avengers. This family is so important to her that she's willing to betray her beliefs to maintain it, and she's willing to die for it if necessary. All of this is conveyed excellently on screen by Scarlett Johansson. Nat's sacrifice is probably my favorite scene in this film. Everything about it functions superbly. It's emotionally resonant, wonderfully performed, and ties up all of Natasha's story threads neatly. The same can be said for basically every scene directly pertaining to her journey throughout the film. Unlike the rest of the founding Avengers, nothing in Endgame serves to significantly damage Natasha. She's not characterized as stupid, selfish, or a joke. Her traits are consistent with her previous outings. That was until Black Widow established that Natasha has two additional families, which really brings into question whether Clint truly had more to lose than she did. That kind of undermines her death. I also like how that film assassinates Natasha by having her bury an entire prison beneath several tons of snow because she needed to break out her faux dad. And how cool was it that the film completely strips away Natasha's moral culpability for Dracov's daughter by having her still be alive and having her father to turn her into Discount Skeletor. So yeah, Natasha, pretty much unscathed until they managed to screw it all up post hoc. Fuck! God damn it! Fuck, fuck, fuck! I suppose Nebula was pretty good in Endgame. With most of the Guardians gone, Nebula is left with a lot to deal with. And barring basically everybody except Black Widow, she's probably the best character in the film. Her journey in Endgame marks the end of the path she was set on in Guardians 2. She's learning to open herself up to others and unshackle herself from her past. Despite being enabled by stupid time travel rules, Nebula's confrontation with her past self serves to highlight just how far she's come. And it's good stuff. It is very annoying, however, that Nebula was apparently too stupid to get the fuck out of 2014 Morag when Thanos found her. Would have taken her two seconds, but the plot demanded she be an idiot so that the big epic final battle could happen. A lot of people died thanks to her comical incompetence, so that's, that's great. Even Nebula, a character who receives plenty of good development in this film, doesn't emerge from it unharmed. I do like Rocket in this film. Rocket is an interesting little character. He's always been super entertaining, but Infinity War and Endgame have really added some meat to him. Being the only original Guardian left standing after the snap, we get to see this character, who has lost basically everybody he cares about, forge friendships with new people. Don't have a whole lot to say about Rocket, but I do like the little rascal. I'm excited to see him and the rest of the gang again in Guardians 3. So who's left? Oh boy! Thanos sucks donkey balls in Endgame. All the work put into making Thanos an understandable villain in Infinity War was tossed out the window in favor of an appreciably flatter version of the character who, at times, I was struggling to distinguish from Bowser in Super Mario Galaxy. Thanos in Infinity War is genocidal and obviously a villain. But that film very effectively showed us that Thanos earnestly believes his goals to be good. An effort was made to establish beyond a shadow of a doubt that, in his mind, Thanos was doing the right thing. He's absolutely wrong, but I can understand why he thinks he's correct. And that's the sign of a competently written villain. The film also gives Thanos some much needed emotional depth by establishing that he does care for others, namely Gamora, even if his version of love is twisted. He's well realized and understandable in that film, despite being a tall purple man with a big chin. Thanos went from ruthless and misguided in Infinity War to comically evil in Endgame. He just wants to destroy the universe because having ascertained that some people don't like like the idea of being deleted from existence, Thanos decided that the correct course of action is to shred this universe down to its last atom. And then, with the stones you've collected for me, create a new one, teeming with life. 
that knows not what it has lost, but only what it has been given. <laughs> hell does that even mean? I think my favorite part about Thanos is how he's simultaneously more powerful for no reason, yet far less intimidating. Fucking get scared by Captain Marvel when in the last film he's plowing through everybody completely unfazed by their efforts. I don't know about the rest of you, but this is just lame. Thanos was thoughtfully crafted in Infinity War, and that effort paid off big time. Thanos is one of the best villains in the MCU, but only if we're talking about 2018 Thanos. 2014 Thanos still has some cool lines and Josh Brolin is still doing a great job, but fundamentally, this version of Thanos is as flat as Ronan or Yellow Jacket. Actually, on second thought, Yellow Jacket was pretty complex. I'm gonna disintegrate you! Oh. So... This all seems horrible, right? If you're looking for an abridged version of everything we've talked about today, here it is. Strap yourselves in. Or don't if you'd rather expedite your trip through the windscreen. <gasps> Avengers Endgame has an utterly broken plot, is basically devoid of theme or a deeper meaning, has left whatever shred of world building the MCU previously had in tatters, and the only aspect of this series which has generally been okay, its characters have been mostly damaged, if not downright destroyed, with only a few exceptions. And if I'm being perfectly honest, that's quite an impressive feat, up there with stapling your feet to the ears of a polar bear without being mauled to death. If you're looking for an abridged, abridged version of everything we've talked about today, FUCKING THING! Thing sucks! And yet, a lot of people love this film. I reacted to it positively the first time I saw it. There's got to be a reason for that. It's probably because Endgame isn't all bad. There are good scenes in this film. Plenty of good scenes. The opening scene is downright excellent. Tony and Nebula playing games in between attempts to repair the ship. Tony distracting himself from the grim reality of a situation while Nebula finally allows her guard to drop. These quiet human moments serve as a great way to refocus our attention on these characters after such a significant event in universe. Tony's recorded message to Pepper is fantastically written, elevated further by an expert performance from Robert Downey Jr. This whole sequence sets the tone of the film brilliantly. But then Captain Marvel rocks up and you're left with some questions such as how in the world did she find them out here? This is space we're talking about. There's literally everything- If she'd shown up one day later, Tony and Nebula would have died due to a lack of oxygen, so it's real lucky she made it in time. And you've got to wonder why the decision was made to have Captain Marvel find Tony as opposed to Thor. Thor is somebody Tony knows. You can work with that. You can actually do something with that, so why didn't you? Also, Tony claims the ship is dead in the water, because again, that's totally how space works. But okay. It's a great scene, putting to one side all those issues. I've already mentioned it, but Tony's argument with Steve when he gets back to Avengers HQ is great. These two haven't seen each other in a long time. Their conflict in Civil War ensured their loss to Thanos. There is a ton for them to discuss, and a lot of animosity they have to reconcile. This is a conversation which needed to happen and it played out exactly as I would have expected it to. I don't have a single bad thing to say about this scene. But unfortunately, this scene essentially marks the end of the conflict between Tony and Steve. The next time we see these two together is five years later. Tony has mostly gotten over his gripes. Either we skipped over the meaningful conflict or it didn't exist. Either a squandered opportunity or just plain bad writing. And that's all putting to one side that the world has seemingly completely moved on from the Sokovia Accords. And maybe they would have after the snap, but there should have been at least a few lines of dialogue dedicated to the Accords. So that great scene between Tony and Steve went nowhere. That's kind of lame. Pretty much all the character-focused scenes which take place during the time heist are strong. Tony meeting his dad and Thor meeting his mum provides both characters with some really solid development. The dialogue for these exchanges is good, and the acting is excellent. These are also great scenes. 
in isolation because how these characters manage to arrive in these locations to have these conversations is nonsensical. So yeah, if you ignore how they got there, these are good scenes, but films are not scenes in isolation. Back when I took math studies at high school, I never really liked that my workings were being graded. The logic being that if I arrived at the right answer, shouldn't matter how I got there. But how you arrive where you're looking to go matters a lot. If your answer to an advanced arithmetic question is correct, but your workings are a hand-drawn topographical map of the state of North Carolina, how is anybody supposed to know how you figured it out? And how can they rely on you to get the answer right next time? Clear workings guide us and others to the right answers. And so do well-constructed supporting scenes guide us smoothly to the emotional highs of a story. All stories are a sequence of events. The the sequence itself is therefore of critical importance. How we arrive at key story beats matters. Payoffs and narrative focal points are enhanced by sound setups. I would go so far as to say that setups and payoffs have equal value, and that the value of our payoffs are contingent upon the quality of their setups. Payoffs are usually the part we begin with when writing a story. They're the inspiration behind the idea, the potent emotional and thematic highs we're seeking to share with other people. The difficult part is then propping these moments up, supporting them with sound plotting and good characterization. Writing the story. The writing in Endgame indicates to me that the setting up of the payoffs the creators wanted was of considerably less importance than simply having payoffs that would make the audience cheer. Good scenes supported by terrible scenes are compromised at best and downright diminished at worst, and most of the good scenes in Endgame rest upon perilous ground. There are moments in this film which aren't compromised by the rest of the narrative, such as Natasha's conversation with Steve when he returns to the comic Compound. But that is an outlier amidst a sea of nonsense. Films are much more than two or three unconditionally great scenes per hour. This may come as a stark and emotionally shattering revelation for some of you, but a story about a Norse god, a century-old super soldier, and a billionaire wearing a metal suit he built by himself in his garage battling a tall purple man with a big chin is a little bit silly. Yet despite how absurd this premise is, it's the foundation of the most financially successful movie franchise in history. And that just goes to show the sheer extent to which we as people are willing to suspend our disbelief. Then again, one could say that all fiction, not just speculative fiction, relies on suspension of disbelief to some extent, and that storytelling in general is essentially illusion craft. After all, Fiction isn't real. And we all know it. The Lord of the Rings is made up. It's as made up as Santa Claus and trickle-down economics. Middle-earth, the Fellowship, hobbits, elves, dwarves, they were all created by a man who lived in our world. A man who had specific narrative goals in mind when crafting the books. Yet the story Tolkien created can nonetheless be engaged with as if it truly happened. We know that Minas Tirith doesn't exist, and that it wasn't besieged by an army of orcs. Yet it all feels legitimate, because the world Tolkien crafted makes sense. The Lord of the Rings is internally consistent, and therefore highly comprehensible. Lots of stories require you to accept premises which aren't exactly realistic. Fantasy stories require you to accept that magic exists and functions as demonstrated. Science fiction stories ask you to buy into the existence of technologies such as FTL drives and advanced robots. Even action films set in the modern day may ask you to accept that the protagonist is hardier than the average person. But this is all fine. It's part of the narrative deal. If plausibility alone define the quality of stories, any story which doesn't exactly mirror the real world would be bad, and that's an absurd standard I never want to see applied to fiction. All that matters is internal consistency. For so long as a story establishes its own rules and follows them, it can be enjoyed without straining our suspension of disbelief. However, our ability to suspend our disbelief operates like a stamina bar in a video game. It 
depletes. Every time you raise an eyebrow at a lucky coincidence or murmur to yourself while contemplating an out of character decision, that bar is going down whether you want it to or not. And it can only sink so low before you'll subconsciously tap out. Once our suspension of disbelief shatters, for whatever reason that may be, that's it. We're finished, out, done. Where you once saw a skillfully weaved yarn, you instead see a mangled, transparent facade. And through the facade, the intentions of the writer are laid bare. Bad writing is revealing of the priorities of a writer because when you find yourself pulled out of a story, it becomes very easy to infer the reasoning behind certain narrative decisions. You see the story for what it is, rather than what it was trying to be. Endgame is a film which I cannot take seriously. Very little about this story makes sense. From the time travel mechanics to the decisions made by the characters, it all feels completely manufactured. It's transparently obvious to me that the priority with Endgame was to hit certain narrative beats regardless of whether those beats made any sense. Why is it possible to destroy the stones? Because we wanted to have a time heist in which our characters revisited some of the most iconic moments in this franchise. So it's possible. Why does traveling to the past not change the future? Because we wanted a scene where Captain America fights Captain America. So it doesn't. Why did none of the Avengers think to get more Pym particles before embarking on the time heist? Because there'd be less tension if they did. So they didn't. Why didn't Nebula leave 2014 the second she'd been discovered? Because we wanted an epic showdown with Thanos and his massive army. So she didn't. Why did the Avengers think it was a good idea to take the gauntlet behind enemy lines instead of fucking anywhere else? Because if they hadn't, there wouldn't have been a climactic struggle for the gauntlet. So they collectively made a bafflingly stupid choice. Right now, you may be thinking, Come on, Fringy, do you honestly think it would be a good idea to sacrifice tension and fun bombastic moments on the altar of logic? This may seem like a reasonable thought to have, but that's only assuming we're dealing with a dichotomy. That there are only two types of narratives. Boring, but adherent to logic or exciting, but entirely inconsistent. If one's priorities are squarely on telling a compelling story with well-realized characters and a sound plot progression, chances are the film is going to be both good and enjoyable. Conversely, if one's only goal is to have a bunch of comic book characters appear on screen at the same time beating the shit out of faceless goons, chances are they are going to create something devoid of substance or sense. Fan service and good content are not mutually exclusive. Stories are entirely capable of tickling balls and stimulating brains at the same time. It's certainly more difficult to achieve both things, but I'm not in the habit of discouraging people from putting in the extra work to make their art just that much better. Then again, why fucking bother if the easier approach yields so much applause? Endgame's blazing disregard for cause and effect is honestly baffling and kind of annoying when what I like so much about Infinity War was its realization of consequences. But clearly, consequences aren't as profitable. I legitimately thought all the pre-snap casualties of Infinity War were going to stay that way. Now, literally everybody except fucking Heimdall is back in one way or another, ready for their new TV shows and movies. That's the problem with Endgame. And the broader MCU now that I think about it. When these films are made, the creative teams behind them aren't strictly trying to achieve storytelling objectives. First and foremost, films like Endgame need to be crowd pleasers because you can't afford to take chances when you're working with a $400 million production budget and a $200 million marketing budget. But what if they had? Taking chances, I mean. Dared to try and do something, not for the sake of pleasing the audience in, ironically, the cheapest way possible. Now, you might say to that, <coughs> Wow, so you just want a completely different film, huh? And to that, I would say, 
Yeah, basically. Endgame isn't a slightly rundown house in need of only a few touch-ups. It's more like an amorphous pile of timber, brick, and jelly at the bottom of the ocean. It's not a matter of making a few minor tweaks or adding a couple extra scenes. Salvaging Endgame calls for a complete rewrite. Now, I don't want to be that guy who boldly declares that my ideas are fantastic and ought to be considered undeniably better than what we got. So take these thoughts simply as some suggestions for what could have been tried and what I think may have yielded a stronger story. Or at the very least, a story I would have preferred to see. First... No time travel. It's almost always a cop-out. Infinity War should have consequences, meaningful consequences on the world. An absence of time travel would force the Avengers to grapple with the effects of the snap under the knowledge that, even if they were able to ultimately undo its effects on the universe, the scars left by the snap would remain if they can't save the world they'll be damn sure to avenge it. No time travel also means that the Avengers as a team cannot evade accountability for what happened in Civil War, because Thanos probably wouldn't have won if the team had stayed together. Whether that means Steve coming around to Tony's point of view, or vice versa, it's a source of excellent conflict which was thoroughly squandered in the version of Endgame we got. Second, the Infinity Stones are not destroyed. I'm not even sure I'm cool with the idea that such a thing should be possible, given that they each control an essential aspect of existence. I know the Russo brothers have said that reduced atoms means that they exist in some capacity, but that's... Uh, keeping the stones in play provides us with opportunities in the future to tell stories about them. If the stones continue to exist in the MCU, it means our heroes must continue to account for them, important questions would naturally arise. Who deserves to own the stones? Where should they be hidden? Here's a potentially cool thought. What if the Avengers decide to keep the stones for themselves, under the pretense that they'll only be used when necessary? That could be the catalyst for our next Civil War story. The Infinity Stones are somewhat stupid in terms of what they do, but the questions their existence raise have not been fully explored yet. It seems like a waste to toss them out for the sake of tying up a loose end nobody at Marvel wants to deal with anymore. If we don't have time travel, but we do have the stones, perhaps the plot of Endgame will be about the Avengers traveling into space and attempting to track down Thanos. Maybe Thanos comes to discover that his plan isn't working out as expected, that the results he wanted didn't arise, and so Thanos becomes active again, effectively taking on the role of the universe police. This could allow the Avengers to finally clue in on his whereabouts. Perhaps this conflict doesn't even arise for a good portion of the movie. Maybe the first hour or even longer is entirely dedicated to the Avengers dealing with the consequences of the snap. Perhaps they're needed now more than ever. Maybe the Accords have been discarded. Maybe the Avengers have become overzealous in policing the world. And so later, when they discover that Thanos has been doing the same thing across the cosmos, they start to reconsider what their place is in the world. Here's a real crazy idea. What if Infinity War was the end of the MCU? What if we end on the phenomenal closing scene of that film, where Thanos watches the sun rise and smiles? I think this scene could play out in multiple different ways. The scene could remain as it is, or Thanos could turn to dust and nod, being perfectly content with the hand the stones dealt him. The gauntlet drops to the ground. The bad guy won, but the stones themselves are a permanent fixture of this universe. And maybe one day, Thanos' wrongs will be undone. It'd be ballsy to end such a popular franchise on such a dour note, but fuck me would I take that over what we got in this timeline. Again, you could claim that a lot of these ideas prevent us from having the big fan service moments we got in Endgame, but storytelling is not a zero-sum game. The writing process can yield boundless opportunities for potent payoffs. For instance, owing to an absence of time travel, Cap picking up Mjolnir disappears in my preferred version of Endgame, despite how much I love this payoff. That doesn't mean Cap can't have a comparable payoff. 
Here's one for you. Instead of picking up Mjolnir, in the heat of battle, Tony retrieves Cap's shield from a nearby bunker and tosses it to Cap without hesitation. Establishing clearly that the relationship is, if not mended, at least in a better place. It could demonstrate that from Tony's perspective, either Steve earned the shield back owing to his actions during the film, or Tony is willing to set aside his differences with Steve out of a respect for him and his prowess. It'd be a meaningful moment for both Steve and Tony and one which could be facilitated without crazy time travel bullshit. All I'm trying to say here is that the creators of this film had options. The endgame we got wasn't the only endgame which could have ever been written. Maybe I am taking endgame too seriously, but the fact of the matter is the endgame is supposed to be taken seriously to some extent. You're supposed to be concerned about the fate of the Avengers. You're supposed to be sad about Tony's death. These are for lack of a better word, serious emotions the creators of this film wanted to get out of you. It is very difficult for me to indulge in these feelings when the story itself makes no fucking sense. Cause and effect are what enable us to understand what is happening in a story. So when cause and effect is as broken as it is in this story, I don't know what I'm supposed to think anymore. Avengers Endgame is what happens when writing is beholden to spectacle. The dysfunctional plot and broken characters are the results of misplaced priorities, and not just those of the film's creators. Do I really have to say it? I think I do. I think I have to say it. I didn't want to do this, but you forced my hand. Here goes. <clears throat> What do you get when you cross an insanely profitable IP with a society that values spectacle more than quality writing? I'll tell you what you get. You get what you fucking deserve. People are quick to bemoan the state of the modern entertainment industry, but the only reason that these terrible movies and TV shows continue to get made are because we continue to not just watch them, but applaud them, as though they're anything but sludge. Having an enormous pool of talent is great and all, but without a sound script, that talent ends up getting put to waste, and scripts have been getting worse. Endgame is deficient in ways which films didn't used to be, and it's not the only one. I fucking wish more films would follow the basic three-act structure in the hero's journey, because I can't take any more of this subversive dog shit and hollow fan service. I think what frustrates me the most about Endgame isn't even the shitty writing or the utterly broken world building, but that it's just an oxymoron through and through. There were objectives beyond telling a good story which informed the writing of Endgame. What do you think those objectives might have been? But the thing isn't beautiful because it lasts. Says Vision, a character brought back from the dead because Disney Plus needed more content. Ironic, isn't it? When not in the end game now. Not even close. Stories are supposed to end, but the Marvel Cinematic Universe never will. Disney won't allow it, but perhaps more depressingly, we, us, Society won't allow it. We want more movies, more shows, more content. We want to see our favorite comic book heroes flying around and punching our favorite villains. And we want these things to the exclusion of solid writing if necessary. Look. I get it. Seeing a bunch of superheroes lined up on screen charging the enemy line appeals to my monkey brain too. But holy shit, there's no reason why an epic set piece can't be propped up by great storytelling. Avengers Endgame is more than just a bad film. It's a shitty parlor trick. A cynical farce. A vacuous product designed to evoke specific feelings from the audience without putting in the legwork to earn its payoffs. And if there was somehow no way to get that big action scene without breaking the story, then perhaps we could have done without the big action scene. Or maybe that's asking too much. Well, that sure was an adventure. Thanks for watching my video and well done for making it all the way to the end. I figure now is a better time than any to either tell you or remind you what I do, what I'm working on, and where you can find my stuff. 
Much of my time is spent creating long-form analysis videos like this one, and you can expect more of them in the future. I have a good idea of what the subject of the next video will be, but these projects take a long time to make, so I can't really say when it'll be done. Fortunately, or unfortunately, there's plenty more you can expect from me in the interim. Aside from my short-form Pitiful Polemics series, in which I discuss smaller topics with the aid of illustrated cues, I run a solo podcast called Cosmoron which I stream every week over on my Twitch channel and subsequently upload to the dedicated YouTube channel. The topics are usually media related, video games, films, TV shows, but I am arrogant enough to dabble in philosophy from time to time. So, if that seems interesting to you, feel free to check it out. If you prefer panels to solo shows, I'm also one of the co-hosts on EFAP, a very long podcast oriented around film discussions. Episodes stream every week over on Mauler's YouTube channel. I made a comic over the last year called Green Teal. I don't know what the next one is going to be or when I'm going to start working on it, but I certainly intend to create more art on a regular basis. My current obsession seems to be pixel art, which has been very fun. You can find basically any piece I make along with my inane opinions over on my Twitter. If any of these projects seem interesting to you, do stick around. And if you'd like to financially support the work I'm doing, head on over to my Patreon. It is the best way you can help me do what I do. All tiers yield the same rewards, early access to new content and behind the scenes materials. So feel free to pledge whatever amount you're comfortable with. That does it for me. Again, thank you very much for watching my video. I hope you have a great day, and I'll see you all next time.